This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blyton. This week we don't have a guest, and that's okay because we have some really interesting stories to talk about. Uh, if you uh, remember a few months ago, we talked about um, Elliot Carter's passing. And one of the really interesting things that we all observed about Carter and that everybody observed about Carter was that he was writing music throughout his whole life. And in fact, at the end of his life, when a lot of composers historically have kind of slowed down their output by the time they get to their, you know, 103rd year, um, Carter was actually extremely prolific in the last decade or two of his life. And his very final orchestral work received its premiere last weekend in Seattle. It was a work dedicated to Ludovic Morlo, who is the new uh, music director in the Seattle Symphony, and uh, received excellent reviews. Do you guys have any, any thoughts on this? Uh, I, I'd hate to call it the, the last Carter premiere, because who knows what's floating around, um, but it's certainly the premiere of his last orchestral work. Do uh, you guys have any thoughts? I just hope that when I'm 103, I'm still writing orchestral works and getting commissions. That'd be incredible. <laughs> right. I hope I'm. I hope I'm still going to the bathroom without help of a nurse when I'm 103. So. <laughs> you guys um, really aim high. That's what I like about you, Sam. You 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 shoot for the stars. Yeah, I think it was pretty decent programming um, that they did because you know the piece that we've got linked is not going to be. It's, it's not specifically about Elliot Carter. It's just a review of the Seattle Sc- Symphony's concert. And they sandwiched the uh, the Carter in between Brahms for no 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 that was Carter. oh really I thought that was the opening work they oh, was opened it? with the Carter oh well that's even better because then you can leave after that's over <laughs> at the at the very least you can leave before they get to the Lone Ranger music yeah they they close the concert with Rossini's William Tell oh, uh, you know. You just don't like fun. I don't like Rossini very much. Okay, uh, although I'll, I'll, I've played, I'll go with you there. I've played the clarinet solo on Forces of Destiny for for the wind ensemble version and the orchestral version. Nailed it. <laughs> I was gonna say if you ever played with a bow, that that William Tell is really. So yeah. No, well, pretty ath- <laughs> when, pretty when you athletic. do the band arrangement of it, yeah. you are the and you're playing clarinet, you are the string section. Right. So. And it's Which, it's harder to do on clarinet, trust me. I bet. Yeah. Well, I, you know, <laughs> you know who I hope is going to be funding some of those commissions for us when we're in our 103rd year is exactly. the National Endowment for the Arts. Hopefully they can stick around that long. They are they they just posted a, a thing on their blog this week um or maybe it's last week. But anyway, they, they have a new blog post about uh, a post grant review program that is in a in its pilot phase right now. And they are going back through um, the the grants that they have given out in the past year to see how successful the, the grant was and to see, I suppose, in the future they might use this to determine um, how to give future grants to be the most effective, whatever that means. Well, so, that's interesting that they say that, but in it's underlined in the blog post the initiative will in no way affect grantees' future applications for NEA awards. So now, I think this is um, just for the pilot program. I don't know if that's going to be the case when they actually launch it. Is that was that your understanding? I, I don't think they're they're specific enough to be able to ferret that that information out. Right. Um, but it is interesting that they're not the the results are only going to be presented at a. Uh, category level like they're not going to say right inside this category this person sucked this person was great this person was okay it's going to be overall this area did this good and overall this area did this good right and they're very and, bi- they're very high level categories like one of the categories is dance like so yeah. all the dance grants and and we should say they're not doing this for every grant this is a board of people that are reviewing um i think they said 20 grants from each of three areas yeah. Um, so in the pilot. that's still a, in this pilot program, right? That's still a lot of work, I would think, to go through 60 grants and through their, their whole process and see how the, the money was spent and see how the project turned out. Um, but it's a pretty small percentage of all of the grants they could have looked at. Yeah. 
you know, if if this is something that they they take up full throttle, they're going to need a lot more staff. So I, I'm going to be looking to apply for the uh, the NEA's uh, research and analysis NEA department. NEA watchdog. Yeah. <laughs> the- um, it's interesting. That I, I'm the one that picked this article up, and it's interesting because we've discussed the the relative merits of the of NEA's funding and how they determine who they're going to fund and everything. So this is a. I'm happy to see that they're doing this. Why? Why What's am the, I happy? Why to, are you happy about it? Because I want to know how uh, you know how the projects are doing, how how effective they are. So, what kind of impact they have, et cetera, et cetera. They, they, they say in this post that they had these these questions about the process, but they didn't really answer them. They kind of left them as these rhetorical devices all in a block of questions toward the end of the post. But one of the things that I thought the whole time I was reading this was, how are you measuring the success of an art project? Like, how, like if, if I make a, an installation, if I write a concerto, if somebody performs a, a, a dance... I don't understand how you're measuring the success of that thing. Well, I know, but I think that they'll have to release an overview of their rubric when they release the results of the the, the investigation, if you will. Perhaps. And it, we should say that it's not as though these grants are just kind of thrown out today with no um, over. You still have to turn in a report at the end of your your project that kind of outlines what you spent the money on. Um, but this is a much more in-depth uh, process that involves you know a panel looking over your project and not just you kind of filling out some forms and turning it in not not to trivialize the 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 forms that are used for an agency like the nea uh because they're pretty serious but um i i think it's interesting that we're kind of we're, we're trying to quantify which is what seems like it's happening the the value of these art projects and I I would I would have some concerns if I guess it'll depend on the criteria, but I would be concerned that they were going to measure things like how many people showed up, um, which is perhaps in part a function of how you spent your your grant money and uh, the the kind of work that you're doing. But it, it might be because of the nature of the art, and I don't think that's something that we should be uh, concerned with in determining who gets grants. Well, it also should be noted that this is in response to um, new government policies about, you know, uh, making government programs better and making them more efficient and use their funds in a more meaningful way. We should also note that the NEA doesn't give out individual grants. So it makes me wonder how exactly when they say, are they going to, because they give money to organizations that give money to individuals. I'm right in that, aren't I, Dave? Well, the, so they don't do individual artist grants, but they mm-hmm. still might give grants to organizations like in, in classical music, like the New York Philharmonic, you know, right? Which is as direct as it gets at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it used to be Sam Mercier's. You could get a grant to write your symphony, but that that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, well, actually, uh, I don't know if it was Lessig himself or it was something that he was retweeting or reblogging or whatever, but. Uh, I was looking at a rundown of ways to make art better in the United States, and I wholeheartedly agree with this, that one of the suggestions was they need to reinstate the individually uh, granted uh, individual grants from the NEA rather than just to organizations. Well, people have been saying that for years. One of the problems with it is that it is – there are a lot of problems with, with – patronage and stuff but it's there's just not that much money and this is actually one of the things that another concern i had reading this blog post and sam you mentioned that if this is going to be a thing that they do going forward that it is going to cost them a lot of money uh that well you didn't say that you said they're going to have to hire people and hiring people costs a lot of money um and my unless they're interns (laughs) okay you so you're going to go be an intern at the nea (laughs) um My concern would be that they're going to spend a big chunk of their budget that could go to funding projects on making sure that they're not wasting their money on the projects that they're giving away. And I think that there's going to have to be a balance struck between those two things. I, I'm not saying that there should be no oversight because there should be somebody saying that you know this was a, a worthwhile project. Um, but I'm concerned that if you're spending so much time looking into those things, 
uh, you're not going to get a lot of value out of the results of those findings. Um, and you're just going to be spending a lot of money paying people to, to look at this, these forms and do these, these, do this research basically into, into these projects that could be going to funding other projects. Yeah. Um, and, and we've seen the NEA budget isn't going to be growing in any significant way, um, over the, uh, in the foreseeable future. I know. And, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan or a detractor of the piece, but, but, you know, we got piss Christ to thank for that. That was like the universal, uh, uh, you know, hammer blow that people used against art and funding of art. Well, it's not just that. It was a lot of things going on around and that Maplethorpe. time. And Maplethorpe. I was going to say Maplethorpe is the, is the big one, but, yeah. um, I don't know. It seems, I, I, my my concern with these kinds of reviews was that would, would be that they would look at that kind of stuff and say, uh, "This is the kind of art that we don't want to fund anymore because uh, it doesn't really cost that much money to make, and we don't need to fund it." And two, uh, it's only going to cause PR trouble for the NEA, and, and I would, it, and it, it offends the distinguished congressman from Arkansas. Well, I think the distinguished congressman from Arkansas is perhaps less distinguished than he thinks he might be. And I don't. I'm not talking about any particular congressman. I'm talking about all congressmen from Arkansas, just right. just to be clear. Um, do you have any, any any other comments, Nate? Do you have any comments on that one? I think I think you guys said it all. A uh, comment <laughs> from from the chat. Uh, Karina says, "I'm surprised that they aren't using a crowdsourcing platform to aid in the process." And I, that's an interesting thing. Um, I would think that it would. We've talked about Grand Rapids Art Prize on the show before, and I would I would be concerned. It would be equally concerned with that that uh, you'd get a lot of people that don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, you know, well, the, it may be the a, thing that wins Art Prize, which is a big. If you're not familiar, is a big contest for visual art mostly in Grand Rapids, and it's uh, a huge dollar amount prize. It's like quarter million dollars. I think they're actually changing that, but. It's, quarter million dollar grand prize and the the person that wins is voted on by the general public which is great because it means there's a lot of public art for a couple of weeks and they have added as Karina's pointing out a juried prize now um but th the 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 problem with those those first few and this is before they instituted the jury prize was that the biggest craziest most spectacular piece would win this quarter million dollars and you'd lose out on a lot of really cool stuff that just was not as flashy right. um so i would think that that could be a concern with crowdsourcing um and uh it would be really hard i think to come up with a criteria for then you'd have to like you know jury the jury you'd have to kind of have some kind of gatekeeping going on to determine who is a part of the crowd um, it's, it's, it seems to me that they would be problematic. Now there, are, there are some things like USA projects, which is kind of like crowdsourcing for specific projects, which is an, an interesting thing. And I would like to see more of that. And I would like to see the NEA more involved in that kind of project where they might be able to make themselves a platform for artists getting funding from other sources. I think that could be a really interesting way for them to it support might. the arts without actually giving money directly to artists. They, they can make a platform for other private individuals or private organizations to fund individual artists. That might be an interesting way, like give them a nesting grant, like, you know, a small like $5,000 or whatever. And also like a crowdsourcing endorsement that is also run through their platform and they use their, you know, name recognition and some advertising dollars to spread the crowdsourcing uh, message for that individual project. Right. And and I, one thing that I applaud the NEA for in this uh, pilot program is that they are kind of keeping the method a secret until they get it right. Because I think one potential danger was that uh, uh, an artist or a group could get a low score based on some imperfection in the system that they're using right now. Um, and that might reflect poorly on them for the future. And it might not be as obvious that this is uh, kind of a system work in progress. And 
hopefully once they get it nailed down, it can be a lot more transparent. But I think making it a little more opaque at the moment is is okay with me. What do you think? Yep. You think that's reasonable? Yeah. All right. So what are you guys doing later tonight? Watching The Walking Dead. Yeah. Well, you will <laughs> and not, not be a among... dog and pony show. What's what dog and pony show are you talking about, Sam? The Grammys are tonight. Uh, tell me about what? Why? Uh, well, you know, we I think we need to mention it. There are four people nominated for uh, best contemporary classical composition, and they're going to be on TV, right? They're all they're <laughs> going to be on TV and get the little. They're going to get the little, uh, you know. Uh, anachronistic statue of the golden no, I mean, they, they had a press conference announcing these winners like they're going to have a press conference announcing these winners earlier today uh, or a little bit later today before the main show in the back room of a 7-Eleven in Soho <laughs> <laughs> they, they clearly have a lot of respect for them is right. what you're saying yeah so anyway there are four composers up you can I'm not going to try well their names aren't too bad Stephen Hartke, which is a piece, Incidental Music to Imaginary Puppet Plays, um, uh, performed by 8th Blackbird. You can see the piece on YouTube right now, live performance. Uh, Tanya Leon. Yeah, uh, Tanya Leon. Uh, Inura for Voices, Percussion, and Strings, and Percussion. Uh, I'm not looking at it, or I would help you. <laughs> Ugis, U-G-I-S, Ugis, Ugis, Prolins, The Nightingale. Uh, it's a vocal ensemble, the Danish National Vocal Ensemble performing, and uh, Radovara, cello, cello concerto number two. I like cello concerti, okay. <laughs> sure. How do you feel about cello concerti by uh, Radovara? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm a sometimes fan of Radovara. All right, I'm with you. And there. Stephen Stuckey, I, there was five. Oh man, Stephen Stuckey. Uh, um, I, I picked Stephen Stuckey, having not heard any of the pieces. Yeah, August 4th, 1964. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. go with that or or the or the uh the Stephen Hartke piece because 8th Blackbird is performing. Sure. Sure. And so, speaking of the Grammys. Speaking of. Uh it won't happen this year. They it says they're going to have some kind of thing where they announce that they're going to have it next year. Uh Grammys are going to start honoring and they don't exactly say, or at least in the piece that I'm looking at, which is in the New York Times, uh exactly what the uh honor is gonna be or what form it's gonna take, but they're gonna honor music educators. Okay. Um, and they're gonna invite people to nominate people for next year's presentation. So anyway, it, I mean it, it'll the Grammys will still be a stupid dog and pony show, but at least they're going to uh, take a little bit of time and uh, try and honor music education on the dog and pony show. <laughs> so explain, <laughs> so explain this to me. They're they're going to are they going to give a Grammy award to a music teacher? It doesn't say. It says uh, a new award for music educators, which will be presented for the first time next year. Hmm. A new award. Maybe it's a new Grammy award in all caps. Because that's how you that's how you write the Grammys apparently, which is dumb and people should ignore that. Uh, but I don't. That sounds. Interesting. I wonder how you would be able to do that because you know the there's the uh, whatever academy it is the recording arts and science. I don't know what the name of the group is, but anyway, there's this kind of closed community of people in the record industry that get to vote on these these awards and. I'm wondering how they would could possibly make it. They would have to be a separate thing, I guess. Yeah. And it I says, mean, you know, they're urging people to nominate educators, teachers from all levels, from kindergarten through college. So, you know, who knows? Yeah. I'm going <laughs> there to, <you> go. <laughs> I'm going to personally nominate now uh, Niles Vigelin, the composition teacher at Manhattan School of Music. The best one-on-one -on -one composition lesson I've ever had in my entire life at the 2000 June in Buffalo. He was there, had a, a, a little lesson with him at a coffee shop, and it was very nice. All right. We should get him on the show. I'm sure he remembers me. I mean, I showed him my wind ensemble piece. I mean, come on. How could you forget that? It's pretty unforgettable. Uh, right. and, and if he doesn't remember you from that, he's probably heard of you now from this show. That's right. That's right. <laughs> He'll be like, "Oh my God, Sound Notion guy is contacting me." Right. That's the that's 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 what we inspire in uh, 
in in people we inspire that kind of devotion i think um you know one thing that we talk about on the show all the time is uh Getting paid. Way, getting paid and, and getting paid, specifically getting paid on the internets. Um, and this has been a big problem because we've been trying to treat the internet and internet uses of music and copyrighted intellectual property in general uh, in ways that we used to treat intellectual property before the, compu- before the internet and before computers. Um, and ASCAP is trying to make things a little bit easier. Uh, they have set up a new system where you can license music to stream not to download and not to like sell people but to stream uh in a mobile app or a website which is a very cool thing um you know because playing playing music over the radio or whatever would require uh you know blanket license from a group like ascap um and it's always been it's it's never been quite clear how you would get that kind of license for a website if you wanted to use it in a website. Um, and th- they're trying to make it a lot easier for you. And it's, I think one of the interesting things is there's a pretty reasonable price. You can get this yeah. new kind of blanket well, license for $240 for a whole year. Well, there's, there's another aspect of that, which is actually way cooler. They don't get into what the price structure would be if you go out of this category. But the requirements are your app or website has to get fewer than 30,000 visits per month and do less than $2,000 in revenue. If you meet those criteria... A month. That's $2,000 a month in revenue. Yeah, $2,000 a month in revenue. And if you meet those criteria, which in the world of you know online business models is pretty small potatoes, mm-hmm. um, I think it's cool that they're giving people that are, you know, sort of like us, you know, DIY people who are doing something online and trying to make something out of it, 250 bucks gives you a catalog of what is it like 85,000 or 8.5 uh, 8.5 million works. Uh John Whiting in chat is asking if BMI and CSAC are doing anything similar to this and as far as I know this is just an ASCAP thing for now. Um so y- y- maybe and and who knows maybe this is the kind of thing that is going to be uh, a a a great source of, of revenue for ASCAP publishers. Um, and we'll see BMI and CSAC kind of doing similar, offering similar kinds of licenses down the road. But for now, as far as I know, this is just an ASCAP thing. Um, yeah. So hopefully it, that competition will uh, inspire some some aping. Or as, you know, as, assuming that that's true, that BMI and the other are not offering this, whenever people like composition students or something ask, you know, what should I, should I join ASCAP or BMI? I'm always like, eh, you know, but now I'm going to say ASCAP for sure. <laughs> really? Because they're trying you to think, do something. You think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of issues with the, with, with people using new music in their app that needs to be licensed from ASCAP or BMI? No, I'm I mean, just saying that I would rather support ASCAP if they're taking the initiative and doing something incredibly smart and fair like this. That's true. That's true. Um, so one thing that I think is always interesting when we talk about uh, streaming and downloading and licensing this stuff is that there seems to be this legal distinction that people always want to make between downloading a thing on the internet and streaming a thing on the internet. Um, mm-hmm. Because and it, it's, again, going back to this um, outmoded uh, analogy of radio and vinyl or cd or whatever buying a thing that you keep and listening to a thing over this thanks sam that's that's good that's good for the mic uh that was sam pouring himself another cup of coffee for those of you in the audio version of our program with two m's and an e today um what was i saying you were distracting with the coffee oh so the the we act like there's this distinction between downloading a thing and streaming a thing, but technologically there's not really a difference. Streaming a thing is just downloading it and playing it, it just right after you're downloading it. Like while it's still down, you're, you're essentially chopping the thing into tiny little pieces and downloading each little piece and playing it as soon as it gets there. Right. This, I, this, this distinction I think is going to be very problematic, especially when it comes to mobile devices um, because we don't have 
um, quite the ubiquitous connectivity with our mobile devices that we have for computers. You know, when we every, everybody we assume anyway that everybody has broadband internet connections that are always on now, um, and it's not a big deal, at least in the U.S., where we don't have big bandwidth caps to be streaming stuff all the time. But in in places like uh, the mobile devices where you may not have a good connection all the time or in parts of the world where you have uh, lower, we have really harsh bandwidth caps, even for your broadband internet, like Australia. Um, I, I think the distinction between download and stream is going to be a lot more important. One yeah. distinction that I could see though is, uh, is so difference between radio and having your own thing on vinyl is that uh the radio people, you you have to listen to their ads. You have to listen to their commercials unless it's NPR or something. And the same thing, I think, is probably still true a lot of the time with streaming services. That you either, like, I, I imagine a lot of people don't pay to take away the ads. They just kind of deal with it. And so there's ad revenue is a is a big part of that picture. I'm sure. Yeah, that's and and. I don't know who knows what kind of apps they're going to use this thing. Like this is not going to be the thing for Spotify, right? Spotify yeah. has too many users and is making, well, I don't know if they're making any money, but they've got too much revenue uh, for this to apply. So um, it, it would, it would play a big part in our, our new sound notion radio app though, for <laughs> right. streaming our deep cuts that happen to be on ASCAP. Right. You know? That's the thing. Our new, our new app is only going to be available to, uh, people that aren't going to give us more than $2,000 a month. And uh, we can only have 10,000 of you using it. Um, and it's only going to play stuff from ASCAP. So, so everybody, scale back your donations limited. now. We, we can't <laughs> right. keep making that much right, right, right. Stop giving us so much gosh darn money. We almost, <laughs> on a, on made, we almost made $15 this year. <laughs> on a related topic, Dave, don't, don't you think that... Uh, U.S. politicians, when they get elected to the House or the Senate, should have to take a digital literacy course. You know, I would be happy if they would just take an English language literacy course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to set the bar pretty low. Um, so, speaking of not making very much money, Yo-Yo Ma is not in that category. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yo-Yo Ma is going to be making a crap load of money, as he always does. Um, but he just won an awesome award. Sam, tell us tell us about the this this new award. Uh, Yo Yo Ma is the the 2013 uh, winner of the the Vilsec Vilcek Vilcek Foundation Award um, for contemporary music. Now, I, I I should have looked up and see who the past winners were um, to see what they mean by or how flexible their definition of contemporary music is. But I have no issue with this. Um, I mean, except the fact that Yo-Yo Ma is probably filthy rich now and he's getting 100,000 bones for this award. But let's assume, and, and I think it's a pretty safe assumption, he'll put it to good use. Um, but he, he's being recognized for his, uh, basically for making music that reaches into different genres and, and, and combines different genres. And an aspect that they really note is that he... It, it, Music that figures out ways to bring people together. Uh, and, you know, saying music brings people together is often just sort of a symbol symbolic. Kumbaya. You know, <laughs> you know. but, you know, I, I think, I think in, in as much as music in and of itself is capable of doing that, he's tried really hard to make music that does do that. Right. And it, can, I can't, I can't imagine anybody that is uh, as, as visible and as effective an advocate <laughs> Not just for classical music, but all kinds of music as Yo-Yo Ma. So yep. that's a f fantastic honor for him. Um, and perhaps he could use some of that money to buy uh, a manuscript copy of <laughs> The Rite of Spring. Which is something like that available? I, <laughs> you know, I wish something like that were available, Nate. That's an excellent, that's an excellent question. Sam, do you know if anything like that's available? Could, yeah. According to friend of the show Rob Deemer, it is available or it will what? be available soon. Oh my god. You can pre order. If you pre order, you get a discount. A discount? How much, Sam? Like, <laughs> it, am I, well, can I get it for a buck or two? 
Uh, according to Boozy and Hawks, it's two hundred and forty nine dollars and eleven cents. Now, where they came up with that number, who knows? Well, it was going to be two forty nine ninety nine. Then you got your discount. <laughs> <laughs> that's it so anyway you know if if i were yo-yo ma and just got a hundred thousand dollar prize certainly i would fork out 250 to get a copy you know I mean, just it would be cool to look at you know but uh i would have to be way 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 orders of magnitude more financially stable than i am now i mean it it is pretty cool yeah it is it is pretty cool if you're looking at the video version that is there's the the handwritten manuscript and it's it's very beautiful uh and is as rob pointed out in his piece uh referring to it on the, it wasn't really about this but it was referring to it on on new music box this week the the calligraphy is is beautiful as you might imagine from a person as meticulous as stravinsky about all kinds of things um and uh the spacing is is very beautiful and it's it's just a cool object that if I had a spare hundred or two hundred and fifty dollars, which I don't, uh, I would totally get one of these things because it looks cool. Sam, you you didn't seem so excited about it when we were talking before the show. Have, have you turned have you turned it around? Well, I mean, it's probably me being mad because I don't have a spare two hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> to buy one, bitter, and yeah. and being resentful of the people that do have two hundred and fifty dollars to lay down for this for a copy. I mean, it'd be cool to have, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, it's, well, I, I, I guess I'll vow this. If I win an ace pool at any time in the next, uh, several years that banks me $250 or more, I'll buy a copy. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, we're, we're all <laughs> pulling for you. Um, this week we're going to, our, our last news story this week is kind of a sad one. Um, conductor James DePriest died this week. Uh, at age 76, he was a, a really uh, just a, a fascinating figure. He was a pioneering composer. He was an African American composer, African American conductor. Um, who studied composition though? Uh, with yes, Persichetti. he did. He did study composition with Persichetti, no less. I didn't know that it was with Persichetti. That's pretty exciting. Um, he was, and I, I, I learned another thing. I learned reading his um, uh, his obit was that he was actually um the the nephew of marian anderson who's famously the first black woman to sing at the met at the in, in new york which is very cool um not only was he pioneering as a, a, a black conductor he was also pioneering as a disabled conductor he had polio uh at an early age which left him uh, his his legs paralyzed, and it's a just a a great story. And he was uh, a a great advocate, and he was just a really interesting guy to read about. He didn't want to be known as a black conductor or as a, a handicapped conductor. He wanted to be known as a great musician. Um, and it was a, a really a difficult thing for him to square those two things because, of course he was kind of a role model for a lot of young black classical musicians. Um, and he didn't want to shun that, uh, role, but he also didn't want to be kind of, uh, I don't know what the word is to, to be thought of as merely a, a black conductor. Right. You guys have any thoughts? Uh, well, it's an interesting thing. I learned reading the obit, that, you know, you're like, he had polio and he was how old? I mean, like, you'd think if he had polio, he must have been 130, you know, right. um, <laughs> because didn't we get rid of that in the United States? But it's it's a, he, on a de State Department-sponsored Asian tour in 1962, he contract, contracted um, polio while uh, conducting an orchestra in Bangkok. That's a real kick in the crotales, man. Hello? That, that, that maybe your joke was just that good that we were all left <laughs> speechless, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. But it, you should definitely read uh, some of these these great uh, obits for James DePriest. Um, there's a good one in the New York Times. We have Sam. I think you found a good one at an Overgrown Path. Um, so check him out. He was a, a great, great musician, and we'll leave it at that. 
Uh, this week, since we don't have a guest, we're not going to do our pick of the week. We have uh, decided that Deep when we cut. don't have a, a ge- I, Sorry, Sam. You're going to have to do that again in a minute. We decided that when we don't have a guest, we're going to go with a... Deep cut. <laughs> a deep cut. Um, and our deep cut this week... Sam and I have already picked a deep cut before. This week, our deep cut selection comes from Nate. So, Nate... You've been awfully quiet this episode. Yeah. You have the floor. So, for this week's deep cut, uh, I went through the, uh, I guess, my music library and found something that uh, did an analysis of in my master's with friend of the show, Philip Sink. So there's this composer, Simon Wickham Smith, and he uh, he's British, I think he's still operating. I wasn't able to find out very much of him when I learned about this piece. But he wrote this piece in, I believe, 2004. It's called Just Kidding. And uh, the movement of it that we're actually going to listen to... Called Brickcliff. Brickcliff. So this this music is is something that we actually haven't been uh featuring very much on the show but it's in, entirely electroacoustic and it uh it was featured on electroshock presents uh electroacoustic music i believe yeah it's a this, big it's a long series yeah so this is volume 9 or yeah so electroshock electroshock presents electroacoustic music volume 9 and this is track eight on that album. It's called uh, Just Kidding, uh, <laughs> Movement 3, Brick Cliff. W- what you will hear is uh, stuff that you wouldn't, like, there's no score for this piece. And this is uh, uh, the whole reason we did an analysis of it. Um, and uh, Because you were so, told that that was not possible. Right, exactly. It, it was kind of a challenge between us and, our, and one of our professors. And, and I think we all learned a lot from this experience which was very nice. And uh, so this piece, uh, it's a mix of sampling and synthesis and moving things around in time where the tools of the trade in this are not, are not necessarily any like physical or electronic instruments at all, but pretty much entirely a computer and maybe some delay pedals and some distortion things. And so you have to think about analyzing this a little bit of a different way. Yeah, Dave, why don't we play a little bit from this uh, Just Kidding Brick Cliff by Simon Wickham Smith. Under the brick, under the brick, under the under the the brick, under the brick, under the brick, the brick, under the brick, under the brick, under the brick, under the the brick, the brick, under the brick, under the the brick, under the the under the brick, under the brick, under the brick, under the brick, under the under the brick, 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 under the under the brick, 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 under All right, so that was an uh, electroacoustic piece by si- Simon Wickham Smith. Uh, it's the third movement of a piece called Just Kidding. The movement is called Brickcliff, and that was our deep cut selected by Nate. <laughs> that was yeah. pretty cool and stuff. 
Yeah, and Dave, you actually overpronounced the uh, the title is actually just kidding without a T in all one word. And <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Which is and I uh, and I th I think this this kind of reminds me of uh, like there's a, I know there's a, there's a couple Aphex Twin albums where he really plays with the letters uh, like in his <laughs> album Drug Use. It's like looking at his text, all all of the words that he writes as the album title or the track titles, they look like gibberish. But if you try to pronounce them, then they come out as these these words. Uh, I think there's <laughs> probably a name for that. That's really interesting. It's it's and it's almost the way the words are used in the in the music because they're not. It's not about. I don't. I I don't hear it as being about any kind of Something cliff. It's right. just the sounds. <laughs> Um, yeah. So that's a that's that is a, an interesting observation. Thank you for yeah. correcting me. It's it's actually not surprising that he's had, takes an interest in that kind of approach to language, because I was doing a little bit of research and can't find an official website for him. The 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 he's very Wikipedia, hard to find. This is by far our deepest cut. <laughs> the the website that's listed as his official website by Wikipedia comes up as. In some Asian language that uses Asian hieroglyphic characters, um, and he's a translator. Yeah, that was, he's an accomplished Mongolian translator. And yeah, so apparently, yeah. so he he did music for a long time and kind of alternated between being that and a linguist, which wow. is pretty fun. <laughs> so check this out; uh, it's very cool stuff. I don't know where you could get it. Uh, that's why I played the whole movement there. Um, but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to see. if you know where you can find this album, let us know. Cause I, it's not on Amazon, <laughs> um, <laughs> but enjoy that recording that we just shared with you. Uh, and, uh, if you can find it, let us know. Yeah. All right. So Electroshock presents Electroacoustic Music Volume 9. I'm sure it's available we'll somewhere a, online. We'll have a link to the all music, uh, sort of overview of it. All online. right. So that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us this week. Thank you to those who joined us in chat. Uh, it was great talking to you all this morning. Uh, it was, of course, as always, great talking to Sam and Nate. Uh, we'll be back next week. We do this show uh, every week at 11 a.m. Eastern Time-ish. Sometimes we start a little bit late, especially when we don't have a guest. That's okay. Um, and if and you can join us for a little chit chat before or after the show, if you'd like, uh, and you can do that at soundnotion.tv slash live. Um, if you'd like to read about any of the, the stories that we talked about, we'll have links to all of them, uh, including usually our pick of the week. And when we have a deep cut, our deep cut, uh, on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, you can also leave us a comment there. Uh, feel free to connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to continue these conversations. If you have any thoughts on this NEA review process that we talked about, let us know. We'd love to We'd love to talk to you about it. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter. On Twitter as a group, we're at Sound Notion. Individually, I'm at Dave McDow. Sam is at Housegoy. And Nate is at Innate Tree. Um, so thank you, gentlemen, for, for, for being here this morning. Um, subscribe to this show in the iTunes store, catch every episode, don't miss a one, and uh, what else do I say here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'd think I'd know, we've done 103 of these now. Um, Can I do a shout out actually? Yeah, I, shout uh, out, shout away. So, a couple weeks ago we had uh, a friend of the show, Bill Ryan, on the show, and uh, talking about his whole project with Bill Band. Tonight is a big night. They're playing at Le Poisson Rouge, I believe it's pronounced. You can just say LPR. LPR. And they are, uh, I mentioned it because they're streaming it live. So if you don't want to watch mm. the Grammys and want to actually get some new music fix, they'll be streaming at uh, 7.30 Eastern time. And we'll have a link to that as well, I suppose. Oh, we'll just tweet it. I don't think a lot sure. of people are going to have downloaded this by that time. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's, that's awesome. Uh, you you got a compliment on your pronunciation of Le Poisson Rouge from the oh. from chat. So oh, thank you. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> <laughs> our music include our introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo, video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again so much for watching this week. We'll be back next week. <laughs>